Our family would like to thank everybody that sent flowers and cards. We appreciate it. My mother was a caring person, a person with a great sense of humor, a great mother, and a great wife. Hey, Bobby, checking the casket to make sure that's your mother you're talking about. That was my dad. He heckled me. How many fathers you know would heckle their son doing a eulogy for his mother? It's the kind of father I grew up with, always trying to cover pain with humor. My dad was blind in his right eye because of a baseball accident when he was 16. His nickname was Dodo. He got that name because as a baby called his dad Dodo instead of Dad Dad stuck with him. Do you know what that's like growing up with your father named Dodo? <laughs> my friends used to bust my balls all the time. How's Dodo doing? When's Dodo coming to the wrestling match? A lot of fights, you know. My dad's Polish, and in Poland, our last name, Golup, means pigeon. So my dad would say it was a one-eyed bird flying backwards. And I believe it was like 90 or 91, my dad, Dodo, gets all fucked up at the VFW club, gets a munchie, and decides to go to McDonald's to get something to eat. He pulls in, orders some food, and falls asleep right there in line. <laughs> they got a Ronald McDonald outside entertaining a bunch of kids who happens to be an off-duty cop. Well, 10 minutes go by, the people in line are blowing their horns, the young McDonald's girl is yelling, yelling at the speaker, sir, move up, sir, move up. The clown off to the cup, hears the commotion, and goes over to Dodo's car. He looks in, sees Dodo sleep, and smells the booze. The clown off to the cup starts shaking my dad Dodo, trying to wake him up. Can you imagine being woken up out of a drunken stupor with a clown in your face? <laughs> sir, you got the right to remain silent? I think for getting McDrunk, the judge gave my dad three months at the Ronald McDonald house. <laughs> oh, fuck you. I made a mistake. I blame McDonald's for that DWI. They're the ones that open up across the street when I drink. All I'm saying is if they didn't open up across the street when I drink, I'd have went home, ate, and passed out. Don't believe everything he tells you. He's full of shit half the time. I'm here to tell you the truth. First of all, I don't apologize for anything. Yeah, I drank. You're fucking right, I drank, and I had a good time doing it. I raised eight kids. That's ten mouths to feed. I never took a penny from no one. Never. Anyone here ever raised eight kids? Huh? That's what I thought. Eight kids. If I'd have known the way two would have turned out, I'd have drowned them when they were babies. <laughs> hey. Honest to God, I've always paid my way. But now you got people on welfare sitting around having kids all day. I'm not saying someone don't need a helping hand every so often, but what the fuck? It used to be called relief to relieve you till you get back on your feet. But now the more kids you have, the more money you make. It's like they're pussies or slot machines. Cha-ching is after 600 a month. Cha-ching is after 1,000 a month. Oh, is that a little heavy for you? Okay. Their vaginas. <laughs> or child, or child bearing machines I got to pay for every time they decide to get fucked. Does that sound a little prejudiced? Let me tell you something, folks. Let's not fucking kid ourselves here. Everyone's prejudiced one way or another. Me, I'm an individual racist. I hate certain people in different groups. <laughs> oh, what's the matter, Bobby? Am I embarrassing you? He acts like I'm the only fucking guy that got a DWI going through McDonald's. <laughs> My dad was a roofer for over 40 years. He was self-employed. He worked out of our house. His work car doubled as our family car. We normally had one of those station wagons with the wood paneling missing on one side. Real shit boxes. One of the floorboards rusted out. He could never get the past state inspection, so in the winter he'd place a patch of snow over the expired inspection sticker. The station wagon had ladders, rope to the bumpers, tar buckets in the far back. We'd always end up getting tar on us somehow. Every so often my dad gives a ride to school. I'd walk in school with little tar stains on the back of my shirt. On the driver's door was a magnetized sign with faded lettering that read Golips Roofing. We stopped to drip in a single trip, so hey, don't delay, plug that hole today. <laughs> he thought that was clever. <laughs> now I got four brothers and three sisters, starting with the oldest, Donnie, Cindy, Bobby, that's me, Barb, Ricky, Randy, Donna, and Gary. The winter time in western Pennsylvania was tough for roofers. There's a lot of days we didn't have lunch money. The school wanted to give us free lunch because we had such a large family, my dad wouldn't accept it. The summers were cool because my dad had a lot of work. We had extra money, he was taking us to Pittsburgh to see the Pirates play. I love that. I saw Roberto Clemente play the last game in Forbes Field in Pittsburgh. 
There were a lot of good times. When they were bad, they were bad. My dad could be an asshole. But somehow, through all the bad shit, I still remember laughing at the same time. The thing I hate about my dad, he was an alcoholic. He drank at all the bars around town. He said he liked to spread the money around. <laughs> he used to take me to bars with him all the time. Do you know how many Slim Jims and pickled eggs I've eaten when I was a kid? <laughs> when I wrestled in high school, I was more worried about my dad coming to the wrestling match drunk than who I had to wrestle. He wasn't like Dennis Hopper in the movie Hoosiers. He wouldn't run on the mat, pin that fuck, you hear me? Pin the fuck. But before the match, we'd stretch and warm up, you know? And I'd see my dad in the stands talking to people, and them slightly turn their heads to avoid the alcohol breath. My dad had three regular places he drank at. The VFW Club, the Eagles Club, and the Helens, an all-black bar, which is weird because I thought my dad was racist. The worst is having to go get him in a bar when he's passed out, right? I go get him one night at Helen's. He's passed out. His money's laying right next to him. I go, uh, Helen, man. Sorry about this, man. That's I. Right. That's my man Dodo. You don't worry. Ain't no one be fucking with Dodo. Mm -mm. Leave my man Dodo alone. One night, my dad come home so drunk, he tried to shit in the oven. <laughs> How do you make that up? <laughs> Something I'm proud about? My brother Donnie and me go down to the kitchen and help my mother pull my dad out of the oven. <laughs> the worst part of him trying to lie out of it the next morning. I said, Dad, last night you come home so drunk, you tried to shit in the oven. No, I didn't. Yeah, you did. I was trying to light the pilot. <laughs> I fucked up. We all fuck up one time or another. I like to drink, so arrest me. <clears throat> I don't drink sociably, I drink to get drunk. If you had to raise these fucking animals, you'd drink too. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong. I got three good girls, but the five boys, I don't know what happened there. I think the best part ran down their mother's leg. <laughs> hey, I lost two sons to the Browns. Ricky and Randy become Cleveland Browns fans just to piss me off. <laughs> when the Browns were playing the Steelers, they would cheer for the Browns, I'd throw them out of the fucking house. I don't care if they're seven or eight. Get the fuck out of the house. <laughs> Become a Browns fan. Why don't you just jab me in my good eye with a fork? You want to rebel? Do drugs. Don't become a fucking Browns fan. <laughs> These kids, they cost me money and hardship all my goddamn life. I got the county jail on speed dial. You think I'm shitting you? Huh? Bobby, go tell him about your brother Donnie at your mother's funeral. My brother Donnie tried to use my mother's funeral to get back with his ex-girlfriend. Yeah. See, we put pictures of the grandkids in my mom's casket. Since Donnie broke up with his girlfriend, he figures if he puts a picture of her son in my mom's casket, it'll score points with her. Man. I got a chance to get back with Sharon, all right? If this will help, what's the big fucking deal? See, the thing is, Yin's don't get it. Sharon's kid love mom. Well, she here. How I look? No, I look good. The suit costs 800. The suit costs more than your whole wardrobe, bitch. It's Italian silk. Pierre Cardon made it himself. These shoes, 180. That's like a down payment on your teeth, motherfucker. <laughs> $30 socks, $22.50 from a silk underwear. Yeah, with $2 in his pocket if he's lucky. Donnie adds a price to everything. There's three prices with Donnie. There's wholesale, retail, then Donnie's price. <laughs> man, I like to look good. What's wrong with that? Just because Jen's just like a bunch of bums, I sell, man. It's all in these. I surround myself with successful people. My buddy Ace just bought a brand new Lincoln loaded. Jen's are just jealous. So my brother Donnie, Got this picture of his girlfriend's son. He wants to put my mom's casket. No one in the family won that kid's picture in my mom's casket. He's not family. But no one won any problems either. It's my mother's funeral. Except my younger brother, Ricky. Ricky wanted to kill Donnie. <laughs> Look, he puts the picture in the casket. They better bring another fucking casket for him. <laughs> he thinks of no one but himself. I'm telling you right fucking now, he ain't putting that fucking kid's picture in my mom's casket. Two weeks from now, that fucking kid won't remember mom. Donnie does what's good for fucking Donnie. He's been crying like a puss for the last two months over his girlfriend, now trying to use my mother's funeral to get back with her. 
What a piece of shit. Fuck him. We'll fight you right fucking now. So, when Donnie goes to place a pitcher in the casket, bang, Ricky throws a straight right. Donnie slips it and tackles Ricky. The water run on the floor in front of my mother's casket. <laughs> Donnie holding on the pitcher. Ricky trying to rip it. The rest of the family trying to break it up. My dad walks in. Jesus Christ. Well, you fucking kids have some respect for your mother. Your poor mother. Even when she's resting in peace, she can't rest in peace around you animals. I swear to God, when I die, bury me upside down. This way you all can kiss my ass goodbye. <laughs> This will never happen at my funeral. You could take that to the goddamn bank. So later that night, Donnie's girlfriend showed up at the funeral. She was kneeling down in front of my mother's casket. Donnie kneeled down next to her. Hi, Sharon. Thanks for coming. Look how good my mother looks. When his girlfriend turns to look, he slips a picture of his son in the casket. Oh, that was nice of your family. Yeah. You know, Sharon, last thing my mother said to me was, she hoped that you and I got back together. She loved that we were together. That's all she wanted for us, to get back together. When his girlfriend turns to leave, Donnie puts a picture back in his suit. I know she's going to call. You watch. She'll call. She'll call. <laughs> I'll bet she calls. A few, days, a few days later, Ricky and Donnie made up. I mean, fist fights are common when my family gets together. We were brought up a loving type family. I never told my dad I loved him. I didn't know how to. If I told my dad I loved him, he would think I was dying or something. You all right? I mean, you're not sick. Are you okay? Being that we couldn't show our emotions, this really fucked up my brother Ricky. One night, Ricky's out drinking with my brother Randy, who's a year younger than him. And they're both drunk, they're not feeling any pain. And Randy says to Ricky, he goes, Ricky, I just want to tell you, man, I love you. Ricky punched him right in the fucking forehead. <laughs> you want to get Ricky off the phone and immediately tell him you love him? He'll hang right up. <laughs> if you want to hear from him for a while, leave a I love you message on his answer machine, you won't hear from him in months. <laughs> Ricky could be downright fucking rude, and he doesn't care about anyone's feelings. And when he's drunk, he'll say exactly what's on his mind. He'd go up to the elephant man, hey, what's with the fucking head? <laughs> now, I got married in New Orleans, August of 96. Ricky was on probation in Pennsylvania. His probation officer wouldn't let him go down to New Orleans. And if he went, he could end up doing 30 days in the county jail. All Ricky had to do was be nice to her, kiss her ass a little bit, but no, we weren't raised that way. My dad instilled in our heads, don't kiss ass. Never kiss no one's ass, never. He didn't know I was going to end up in Hollywood. <laughs> Ricky, Ricky was on probation in Pennsylvania because he got in a fight with his anger management counselor. <laughs> Ricky said he started it. I knew I was in trouble when I picked Ricky up at the airport in New Orleans. He was drunk coming off the plane. His first words were, hey, let's get fucked up. I might end up doing 30 days in Pennsylvania for four days down here, so fuck it, let's make them full days. My probation officer tells me I can't go to New Orleans. Fuck that shit, bitch. I got my fucking ticket. I don't give a fuck what you say. I'm fucking going. My wife, Emily's family, is totally different than my family. They're nice. <laughs> Her family goes to church. My family goes to jail. Ricky was a total terror in New Orleans. At my bachelor party, he tried to pick a fight with me. At my bachelor party, you think you're a big shot or something, huh? You think you're special because you're getting fucking married? What the fuck does that mean? <laughs> I thought I was going to throw him out of my wedding. The morning of my wedding, Ricky was up all night snorting coke and drinking. At this point, everyone's had it with him. We take him golfing and keep him stoned all morning and try to mellow him out. He promised me he'd be okay. That lasted until he got back to the hotel and started drinking again. Now, we got married in Holy Name Church, this beautiful Catholic church in between Tulane and Loyola University. The priest who's marrying us and the deacon are my wife Emily's cousins. We're standing at the altar. 
To Emily's left are all the bridesmaids. To my right are all the groomsmen, starting with Donnie, Ricky, and Randy. The priest, Edgar Tibule, is reciting our vows. This is the most important time in my life. I hear Ricky whisper to Donnie, when we get this over with, I'm going to go out and party. <laughs> and Donnie says, man, you got no respect, Ricky. You know what your problem is? You don't love fucking Jesus. <laughs> and Ricky goes, where do you get the balls to tell me I don't love motherfucking Jesus? I'll beat the Jesus out of you right here. And the priest shushes Ricky. And Ricky stares at the priest. You're lucky you got that collar on. When Ricky went back to Pennsylvania, he ended up doing 30 days in the county jail. You see what I'm talking about? Ricky, he's, uh, what do you call it? Um, he's too fucking mean. He should be allowed to drink. I did what I could with him. You know, I beat him as a kid, but I don't think it helped. <laughs> he don't listen. None of my boys know how to listen. Bobby, he was my first fucking pain in the ass. Don't let him bullshit you. He went to prison for two years. In 19, um, like my son Randy, he marries this bitch who grew up in this trailer park but with this rich girl attitude. You know, she never blended in with the family like water, like oil. He loves her, but hey, he's the one that got to fucking live with her, not me. My brother Randy is a bullshit artist. I mean, he's not like self-centered like Don is. He had the anger like Ricky. We got more shit than all my brothers put together. You could tell Randy a story. A week later, he'll tell you the same story, embellish it, and swear to God it's his. <laughs> now, Randy's a happy drunk, but I don't know how he could do it. He'll go out and drink all night, sleep for two hours, and go to work at the steel mill. He'll do this like three weeks in a row, take a week off, and then start all over again. Yeah, I've been some three-week binges. What the fuck? My old lady spent over $10,000 playing lotto and bingo in four months. Set us back almost two years. Now everything's okay. Now I only drink for a week straight. <laughs> hey, I like to drink. Like father, like son. The way I see it, I'll drink till I need a new liver. Hopefully I'll need one earlier than later. Just so I'll be more healthier for the operation. <laughs> get a new liver, get healthy, start drinking again. By the time I need another liver, fuck it, I'll be dead. <laughs> you want to go have a drink? <laughs> Ah, oh, fuck it, I'll see you later, out. I got three beautiful daughters. Cindy Bucusi, Barbara Davelli, and Donna Carrera. I lost my three daughters to the Italians. Can you believe that shit? <laughs> I got three Dago son-laws. Between them, I can't even get a good fucking pizza. My oldest daughter, Cindy, marries John Vito Bocuzzi from Bari, Italy. He's one of these, um, what do you call, uh, stay-at-home dads. He takes care of the kids, washes dishes, cleans the house. I can't figure out what the fuck, whatever. My oldest sister, Cindy, is the mellow one in the family. However, she did knock out a girl in the bathroom who was heckling me at one of my shows one time, but that's another story. <laughs> It might sound crazy, but by Golub standard, Cindy still qualifies as mellow. Now, Cindy is hard of hearing. She lost some of her hearing when she got measles when she was a week old. She says it's great being hard of hearing. She hears who she wants to. <laughs> now, her husband, John Vito, is one of these Italian guys who wants to hug you all the time. You know, we're really not the hugging type family, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> it's like, look, John Vito, if we just didn't finish the tour in Vietnam, fine, but I just seen you yesterday, I ain't fucking hugging you. <laughs> Seeing John Vito trying to give my brother Ricky a hug is priceless. <laughs> Ricky, come on, give me a hug. You too mean. Give me a hug. Get the fuck out of here. Don't even, don't even fucking think about it. <laughs> my sister Barb is right under me. Now, Barb is one of these sisters that worries about everyone in the family. You know, she worries so much, she worries. She's not worrying. And she's hyperactive and doesn't take shit from anyone. Unlike Cindy, she doesn't qualify as mellow. 
Bob got in a fight with the local karate instructor because he refused to give a kid a black belt. Now, she's the CNN of the family, 24-hour family updates, and swears she could solve every crisis. <laughs> she's a defender of the golden name, blood's thicker than water. Bob's the kind of sister that when you get older and sick, she'll wipe your ass. Now, I, I know it don't sound important now, but later, trust me. <laughs> Her husband, Chris, is a pattern maker. He makes wood furniture. And one day at work, he got his hand caught in a bandsaw and lost two and a half fingers. The company he works for, Precision Pattern Makers, gave them a nice settlement. They took the extra money from the fingers and put an addition on the house. I went, see the addition, looked good. I think it was worth two and a half fingers. <laughs> My sister Barb goes, damn, another half finger? We gotta got a new washer and dryer. <laughs> My youngest sister, Donna, uh, she's the youngest girl in the family. She's hard to hear in her left ear, and Cindy's hard to hear in her right ear. You get these two together, it's like the deaf leading the deaf. Sometimes they'll hang out together, this is where they got two good ears. You know. But in Donna's world, water's thicker than blood. She married this guy named Nick. Now, no one in the family likes him. He's a control freak, very insecure. Put this way, Donna's thoughts and beliefs are exactly the same as her husband Nick, Nick like some ventriloquist act. If you met Nick for five minutes, your first thought would be, what's not to hate? Now, my first sexual experience, I got gonorrhea. This is one of the most embarrassing times of my life. I'm a senior in high school and a star wrestler, and I'm bragging to a friend of mine. I said, you know, I got lucky last night with Gail Thomas. He looks me in the eye and says, Gail Thomas, hope you wore a condom. You know, I got VD off her. But don't worry about it. If it starts burning when you pee, go to free clinic by the hospital. In fact, I'd go anyways. <laughs> I hated that name, free, D, free, uh, free clinic. It sounded so dirty, you know? I'd walk by there four or five times, and I'd chicken and go out go in every time I just kept checking out, you know. Then I start hearing these horror stories about VD. Fat Rat, one of the local neighborhood guys, said VD can make you go blind. VD killed Al Capone, and Al Capone was a bad motherfucker. <laughs> I had a nightmare one night, I'm peeing in the toilet, and the water starts boiling. <laughs> and steam is like rising from the bowl. A hot burning flame shoots out of my dick. I'm screaming in pain, everything goes black. I'm blind, oh shit, I can't see. I wake up in a cold sweat, man. I said, I gotta get this checked out. I go to clinic. It's not good news. I'm positive. Fuck, I was positive I'd be negative, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I gotta talk to somebody. Somebody, you know, I could trust. Somebody will tell me the truth, you know? My dad. <laughs> hey, dad. Um, listen, I... I uh, I gotta tell you something here, but this has to be just between you and I. I just found out I got gonorrhea. Now I'm looking for that pearl of wisdom, you know? He goes, gonorrhea, that's too bad. She's good looking at least. <laughs> she have a nice ass. No, I'm just joking. Look, go to the clinic, get a shot, you'll be okay. I go downstairs the next morning, my whole family's in the kitchen going, I got a gonorrhea, couldn't I take a pee up? <laughs> yeah, thanks, Dodo. <laughs> now, I don't know if anyone here grew up in a large family, but there was 10 in our family, one bathroom. And one time our kitchen sink broke, and we had to wash dishes, uh, we had to take a bath, um, we had to wash dishes in the bathtub for like four and a half months because my dad refused to get the kitchen sink fixed. I'd have to take a bath with uh, cold water because someone just got done washing the dishes. The only way to get in hot water is to wash dishes and take a bath at the same time. Now, I don't know if anyone here has ever been hit as a kid, but my dad was with a, what they call a spontaneous hitter. He'd get pissed and hit us wherever he'd get his hands on it. One time he hit, hit me with a toaster, I had GE tattooed on my ass. Another time he lines me up against the wall in the kitchen. My mother's stirring soup with this big wooden spoon. He grabs it out of her hand, gives it to me right there, hands it back to her, she continues stirring the soup. Now those were the spontaneous hittings, then there were the planned beatings when you did something really bad and your mother would say, wait till your dad gets home. <laughs> that waiting was a bitch, wasn't it? It was like the death row for kids. <laughs> <laughs> I went upstairs and hid and stuck a pillow on the back of my pants. My dad comes home, Bobby, come on downstairs, get against the wall. I'm standing there and I'm waiting for it. I could hear that belt being pulled through his loops. 
And he starts laughing. Hey, Bobby, what happened to your ass? <laughs> it looks like it's deformed. What, you got a load of shit back there? <laughs> Get out of here. I've escaped an ass whooping. It didn't work the next time. I punish my kids if they deserved it. That's how I was raised. I mean, I didn't randomly come in the house and start beating the shit out of kids. Okay, Donnie didn't count. <laughs> but they knew when they did something wrong. And as far as I'm having to wash dishes in the tub, you know why? They broke the sink. How many kids you know break the knobs off the sink and bend the water spigot? How the fuck do you bend the water spigot? I used to go through three screen doors and new set of furniture every year. I had a neighbor who bought new furniture, put plastic on it, and his kids weren't even allowed to sit on it. I mean, what the fuck? Why don't you just leave it at the furniture store? Drive by, go see that? That's ours. We bought that. <laughs> <laughs> My kids broke four kitchen tables. So finally, I built a picnic table in the kitchen out of two by sixes. I said, you break that? you off the fucking floor. I used to love hearing Donnie explain to his big shot friends about the picnic table. Oh, my parents are going for that outdoors look. You show me a father's manual that says I got to replace shit that they break like I'm a goddamn warehouse. I understand they were kids at the time, but Jesus Christ, I had a tough time feeding these kids, let alone worrying about replacing shit all the goddamn time. I could never keep anything in the refrigerator with myself with eight kids. I mean, don't get me wrong. They can eat anything they want, but leave my buttermilk alone. There's two things I had to myself, pig's feet and buttermilk. Next thing I know, someone's drinking my buttermilk. No one in the house even like buttermilk, it'll disappear. I mean, what the hell is this world coming to when you can't keep your own buttermilk? <laughs> oh, I know some of you think, oh, it's only buttermilk. No, it's not just the fucking buttermilk. <laughs> My brother Gary is the youngest one in the family. Let me tell you something. Hands down, Gary is the toughest person I've ever met. Gary's retarded strong. <laughs> I'm telling you, I met world champion boxers, black belts, football players. Gary would kick all their asses. Gary used to collect money for a local crack dealer named Crazy. Crazy was a 270-pound black guy, solid muscle, but used Gary to get the money. Gary's like 34 years old. He's been smoking pot since he's been 12. He's been a crack addict for the last 14 years. And when you're a crack addict, you'll do anything for money. Gary, his crackhead slash stripper wife and three kids, rent a house off this old lady. Okay? They move in, no security, none of that shit. Gary never paid a lady one month's rent. A year goes by, the old lady's son goes to throw Gary out, and someone else was living there. Gary moved out six months earlier and was charging this guy rent. <laughs> Gary made a big score one time for like 18,000 cash. He goes on a crack binge and smokes it all up in three weeks. He became like the Pied Piper of the projects, like get all these crackheads falling around. As the money started to dwindle, so did his followers. After Gary smoked up the last of the money, he turns around and everybody's gone. He's broke, jonesing. You gotta make some money quick. He calls up a local pot dealer to buy a half a pound of pot. The pot dealer meets Gary in an alley. Gary reaches in the window, grabs the pot, runs away, sells the pot, buys some more crack. The pot dealer got so pissed at Gary, he put a $200 hit on him. $200. After Gary's lungs absorbed the last of the crack, the craving was fucking unbearable. And Gary calls up the pot dealer. Hey, man. Understand you got $200 on the street. For anyone to break both my legs. That's right, motherfucker. Man, I'm Jones so bad right now, I'll break one of my legs for a hundred. <laughs> I love all my kids equally. But Gary, that's the one that scares me. I've been having trouble with him since he's been 12 years old. He's always, you know, He's always trying to get over on somebody. I love him, but he's no fucking good. Gary would rob Jesus on the cross. A few years back, Gary was in court. 
for writing $8,000 worth of bad checks. The judge set the bill at $5,000. Gary asked me to loan him the money. If he could get out, I said, I'm not loaning the money. I'm tired of you bailing me out of shit all your goddamn life. Gary turns to the judge and said, Judge, can I write you a check and make a good when I get out? <laughs> the judge says, are you crazy? You're in here fighting for bad checks. <laughs> I got to tell you, when I left that court courtroom, I busted out laughing. I mean, the ball's on Gary, right? <laughs> I, uh, I wish I had a, a magic wand to make his crack habit disappear. I mean, I don't know what to do with him. Last time Gary was in jail, they had a shrink or, what do you call it, um, you know, a therapist, psychiatrist come in, try to talk to him. For what? To pay someone $75 an hour to listen to your problems? I'll tell you what, I'll save you some money. Come to VFW, buy me drinks, I'll listen to your troubles for an hour. Hell, drinks are cheap there. For $10, we'll both get fucked up, you know? Oh, I know it's someone you're thinking. You're thinking, you know, Gary's uh, problem is me. Look at his past. So that's the problem now. Everyone lives in the past. You got to forget that shit. Move on. Let it go. If you don't, it'll fucking eat you up. If I wake up every morning and go, geez, I got 10 miles to feed. I'm blind in one eye. What am I going to do? You just do it. People are always sitting around trying to figure out why they're fucked up. Fuck that. Just fix your problems. It's easy for Gary to blame me and my ex-wife because we are drunks. But at what point does someone take responsibility for themselves and quit blaming their fucking past for everything? When I drank... I made sure these kids were taken care of. With that crack shit, right out the goddamn window. Look, it's like this. My mother was married to this guy named Harry for 26 or some odd years. Harry was like the kid's grandfather. They grew up with him. Anyways, when my mother died, Harry couldn't handle it. He was depressed for like three years or something. He was driving me fucking nuts. He's moping around, moping around my house all goddamn day. Then he went through this phase where every week he thought he had a different disease. One week he thought he had AIDS. Harry, AIDS, you're 70 some years old from what, your fucking hand? <laughs> so finally I couldn't take it. I wrote down 10 diseases and I threw them in a the hat and I pulled one out. I said, Harry, this is your disease. Sickle cell, fucking stick with it. <laughs> Bobby says, you know, he might need group therapy, you know, for people who lost their spouses. I said, don't come back here and run that Hollywood fucking therapy bullshit on me. You know what Harry needs? He needs to get his dick sucked. That's right. Once he gets his dick sucked, he'll be okay. Bobby says, I'm crazy, huh? Mr. Actor Hollywood comes home that Christmas. Oh, I saw Harry today. He looked like he was happy. He looked like he was in the holiday spirits. Holiday spirits my ass. I got his dick sucked for him. Yeah. I know this black chick down in Helens, right? I give her 15 cash, $20 in food stamps. I pay 50 cents on a dollar and maybe $10 in drinks. For $35, I don't have to hear Harry wine anymore. <laughs> you know what the moral of the story is? Huh? You know what the moral of the story is? Get your therapist to suck your dick. <laughs> My, uh, my mother died on Christmas Day in 96. Four months later, my grandfather Harry died on Easter. A month after Harry died, my dad was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. He had to undergo an eight-hour life-threatening operation to remove the cancer. The procedure was called the Whipple operation. What they, cut, what they do is they cut out part of the pancreas and the stomach and some other organ at time all together. Two hours after this massive surgery, the doctors let us see my dad. Each kid was given a minute or two apiece. My sister Barb couldn't go in alone, so Cindy went in with her. And when they came out, Barb's knees buckled, and then we had to help her to the hallway. I went in next, and my dad's lying there, hooked up to uh, IVs, monitors, wires, everything going at once. In his right hand was some device they kept trying to, they kept pressing to try to ease the constant pain. This is the first time I ever saw my father in a vulnerable position. It was surreal, man. It was like my throat was so dry, I wasn't sure if I could even talk. I mean, all I wanted to do was tell him I loved him, but I didn't know how to. So, you know, I covered up like, hey, Dad, um, 
You beat the surgery, man. You did okay. You did great. You're going to... Hey, you know, Dad, I'm going to go. Dad, uh, Donnie's coming in next. My dad motioned to me with his pinky finger to move closer. And he says, in a low, weak whisper, Hey, Bobby, you tell your brother Donnie if I die, I still want the $100 he owes me. <laughs> that moment tells you more about my old man than anything else I could tell you. I mean, even if you're going to die, you might as well laugh, have a good time, you know? The doctors gave my dad 18 months to live. I like the way they put numbers on it, like there's some office pool going or something, you know? <laughs> but screw them, man. My dad could beat anything. A few weeks later, I was back in Los Angeles, and the news coming from the front wasn't good. CNN Barb said my dad was getting bad. His eyesight and hearing was slowly deteriorating, and he was starting to get weaker. But I knew he still could beat it, right? This is my dad. We'll beat this together, man. We'll be all right, you know? Because of my dad getting progressively worse, someone needed to stay with him day and night at the house. Everybody was pitching in and doing what they could do. My brother Ricky says, I'll do anything to help out except stay alone with dad at night. He ain't dying on me. <laughs> I went back for a week to see my dad, give my sisters a breather, spend some time with him, you know? He hated that people had to babysit him. I'm staying at my dad's house one night. And I'm sitting in the living room, and he's sleeping upstairs. And it's just me and him alone. And even though he was sleeping, it was our time, you know? I turned off the TV, and I just sat there, listening to my dad snoring away upstairs. Sitting in that room where I spent so many years of my life, I started thinking about all the things that happened in that house. I started thinking about being 12 years old. I started thinking about the day Roberto Clemente died. Roberto Clemente played right field for the Pittsburgh Pirates. Roberto was one of the greatest baseball players ever to play. I mean, Roberto wasn't just a baseball player. He was like part of our family. We loved him. During baseball season, everything was Roberto this, Roberto that. New Year's Day, 1972, Roberto Clemente's plane went down during a humanitarian trip to Nicaragua. He was taking food down to victims of this devastating earthquake. When we got the news the next morning, my whole family sat around the TV in the living room waiting for news, any news at all. This was 10 o'clock in the morning, and we were feeling like a family member was missing, you know? There was no fighting, no joking, no kidding around. This was serious. This is Roberto. We'd say little things like, Roberto would be okay. He could swim across the ocean. Around 9 o'clock that night, we got the latest news, and they said they found Roberto's plane, but he was missing. Another problem was his plane went down in shark-infested waters. A little after midnight, my whole family fell asleep right there on the floor, waiting for updates, seeing if Roberto would make it. Only my dad and me were still awake, and for an hour, I had them all to myself. My dad fell asleep right next to me on the floor, snoring away. I closed my eyes and dreamed of a plane smashing into the ocean and seeing Roberto's body floating. Sharks were circling his body. Some tried to bite at him, but they couldn't pierce him. This is Roberto. So they just swam away. My dad woke us up 6.30 in the morning and said they found Roberto and he was dead. We all started to cry instantly there. And for a week, we were on a daze. As I'm sitting there, remembering this time in my life, I started to realize that I couldn't hear my dad snoring anymore. I was... Uh, I was starting to get a little panicky, you know? And, uh, and then I heard the ceiling creaking, and he was slowly working his way down the short hallway to the bathroom. I went upstairs to make sure he's okay, you know? And he's standing there in the bathroom, peeing in the toilet, leaning against the wall with his left hand like he has as long as I've known him. He knew I was standing there watching him. He would have told me to get the fuck out of here, you know? It was the first time I saw my father, without a shirt since his operation, he looked emaciated, all bones, as, as if he was in a concentration camp for years. I couldn't breathe, because for the first time I realized my dad was going to die. I went downstairs and I, I cried for two hours straight. It was... Um, Hard going back to Los Angeles, not knowing that this would be the last time I 
see my father alive. About a month later, uh, my sister uh, Cindy calls up Ricky. Says, Ricky, you got to stay with dad tonight. Nobody could do it. I'm no, I don't care, Ricky. You got to stay with dad. Wouldn't you know my dad died that night? <laughs> Ricky calls up my brother Randy. Randy, get over. I think dad's dead. Okay, call 911. I'll be right over. Randy goes over. Ricky's hysterical. Oh, shit, Randy. Is he dead? Motherfucker did it on purpose. <laughs> they waited for me to be here. Oh, shit, Randy. Waited for me to be here. Prick. My dad died on 90, 1997 on Labor Day. I lost three people in nine months. My mother died on Christmas. My grandfather died on Easter. My dad died on Labor Day. If I lose someone Thanksgiving, all my holidays are shot. <laughs> my dad wrote out in his will exactly how he wanted to be buried. The first thing he wanted was for all the kids to meet in front of McGonagall's funeral home so we could go in together giving us 45 minutes alone before people start showing up. We entered the funeral home and worked our way around a short hallway to a room where my dad was laid out. As we work our way closer to the casket, something's not right here. From the back of the room, this, this thing sticking out of the casket. We walk up to the casket, we start cracking up. My dad's laying in the casket wearing a Pittsburgh Pirate shirt with a pack of marbles in his pocket. Blue jeans with work boots with tar stains on them. He's wearing a Pittsburgh Steeler hat with two fishing lures attached. A six pack of Budweiser beer by his left ear that's cold. In his left hand is a fishing pole sticking straight up out of the casket. In his right hand is a trowel, you know, to spread tar and cement with. My brother's Ricky's leaning on the casket going, that's my trail. <laughs> Son of a bitch took my trail. Man, we just cracked up, man. My brother Donnie says he's going to go talk to the funeral director about getting my dad a suit. I said, you know what, Donnie? Fucking forget about it. This is dad's wishes. Man, I don't care. I got a reputation in this town. So Donnie goes down to the hall to talk to Tim McGonagall, the funeral director. He tries to convince him to put a suit on my dad. Tim says, Donnie, look, if you want to go to your house and get a suit? Fine, I'll leave it up to the rest of the family. Donnie's but. Wait a second, you ain't got a suit and I ain't get one of my suits. My suits are $1,000. If I do get it, can I get it back when he's done with it? <laughs> Later that night, there's a line of people out the front door waiting to pay their respects to my father, Dodo. I mean people from all walks of life. Slovaks, I mean Irish, Greek, Polish, Jewish, rich or poor, you name it, they were there. Watching people leave my father's casket, not knowing to laugh or cry, I got to tell you, it was special, you know? And it was weird because throughout the night I would start crying and it's my father, you know? And I'd go up to the casket and I'd start to laugh, you know? The next day after the wake, everybody went to St. John's Church for Mass. The church was packed with family and friends. My father's casket's lying next to a podium where a priest had just finished Mass. And the priest says, Mr. Gollop has requested that a letter be read at his funeral. And these are the exact words. First and foremost, I'd like to thank everybody for coming to see me off. To my oldest son, Donnie, what about that get up in the casket? How'd you explain that to your big shot friends? <laughs> oh, by the way, Donnie, if you put a picture of your girlfriend's son in my casket, I'll haunt you for the rest of your life. To my oldest daughter, Cindy, you're a hard worker. Hopefully some of that will rub off on your husband. <laughs> you might call him Mr. Mum, but we call him Mrs. Doubtfire. <laughs> to my son, Bobby, the actor, I'm showing more emotion dead than you have your whole career. <laughs> to my daughter, Barb, whose husband lost so many fingers, he can't grip a baseball. I don't think the addition on your house was worth two and a half fingers, two fingers tops. <laughs> to my son, Ricky, I just want to let you know that everybody in the family loves you, 
especially your brothers? <laughs> what do you say after the funeral? You go give them an all big hug and kiss. <laughs> now, Ricky, I know you didn't want to stay with me alone at the house at night. So if you do stay and I die, it was planned. <laughs> to my son Randy and his wife Wendy, who never saw a trailer she didn't like. <laughs> you know, Randy, your wife never fit in with the family, but then again, we all have a full set of teeth. Oh. By the way, Wendy, no matter what Sydney and Barb say to your face, they don't like you. <laughs> but who are they to judge? To my youngest daughter, Donna, I've always liked your husband, Nick, even though the family calls him Nick the Dick the Ventriloquist. <laughs> to my youngest son, Gary, this is the last time you go through my pocket, so hurry up before they lock the casket. <laughs> what am I thinking? Like that ever stopped you before? Just remember, Gary, it's your wife who's stripping, so don't blame your brother Ricky for hitting on her. <laughs> In leaving Yens, I hope that caused as much trouble for you as you have for me the last 42 years of my life. Wow. After the services at St. John's Church, everyone proceeded to the burial site. My dad was getting buried on top of this towering hill. Some of the cars in the funeral procession were pieces of shit. My brother Gary's car had trouble making up the hill. His muffler was missing, was shooting out black smoke that was covering Donnie's brand new Cadillac behind him. When we reached the top of the hill, my brothers and me, along with the other pallbearers, placed my dad's casket under a canopy. The canopy had enough room to protect my family and anybody else that could squeeze in from the blistering sun. A man in a military uniform places an American flag over my dad's casket as a Marine plays taps on the horn. The folded flag is handed to my sisters, Cindy, Barb, and Donna. Just then, a van load of local VFW vets pulls up. They empty out and line up along the edge of the hill. A bunch of old-faced drunks would make the F Trooper look like the Marines. I said to Randy, I said, Randy, when was Dad in the service? Dad's never been in the service. These are his drinking buddies. He's been buying, he's been buying these guys drinks for years at the VFW, so I'm going to give him a 21-gun salute. The only problem with these vets, only three of them brought regulation rifles. One vet had a shotgun. <laughs> Another vet had a hunting rifle with a scope. One vet had a nine millimeter pistol. And one just had a lighter. <laughs> they aimed their guns in the air, away from the crowd. One of the vets yells, and fire! All of a sudden, the vet shooting shotgun is thrown backwards. He wobbles, falls backwards, and starts to roll down the hill, head over heels. Everybody's in shock. We went to the edge of the hill watching this 80-year-old guy roll down the hill. I look at my family, man, we're cracking up. There's this old drunk laying down the bottom of the hill. My dad's laying dead over here, and everybody there is laughing. I couldn't think of a more fitting funeral for my dad, man. I miss my dad, honest to God. I think of him every day. You know, let me explain something to you people. I know I might not have been the ideal father, but then again, I didn't have the ideal kids either. But we had a lot of good times together, a lot of laughs, a lot of great memories. You do what you can do. We never had a pot to piss in, but I was rich. I had eight healthy kids. I was content with my life. I think life's simple. Find what you're content with and be content. So quit taking life so serious, okay? 
and go have one for me. These are my two kids. This is, uh, this is uh, Peyton, he's four and a half, and Parker, he's a year and a half, I don't know if you see it. I tell him I love him every day, a hundred times a day. Look, my dad wasn't perfect. He made a lot of mistakes. There were times I hated him. But I know he loved me, and I know he knew I loved him. We showed it and felt it, we just couldn't say it. I mean, maybe you got someone like that in your life, but if you love him, tell him before you miss the chance, I know. I missed my chance. I never told him. Hey, Bobby, why don't you tell me now? Dad? Dad, I love you. I love you, Dad. Bobby, you okay? I mean, you're not sick, are you? Thank you. I, uh, I, I, 